Good evening and oops, good evening. <laughs> and thank you for all for coming out tonight in the weather that we're having. Uh, you might say, well, what's so important about bones if they don't hurt? What does it matter? Well, I hope that I can convince you otherwise here with some of the information we're going to cover tonight. <clears throat> So when we talk about weak bones, they use the term osteoporosis. And that means bones, and as you can see on the contrast between the two up there, that there's sturdy bones that have a lot of reinforcing, and there's osteoporosis or weaker bones that just don't have the reinforcement. And those are the ones that are more susceptible to breaking. And that's what we uh, hope to be able to avoid. So, does, does weak bones occur at any age? Does it occur just when you get older? There's lots of reasons the bones could get weak, but generally your peak bone strength is when you're around age 25. So this is why you need to encourage your teens to drink their milk and build up their bones because peaks around 25 and from there on it's downhill. So you want to make sure you get them built up. We usually run into the problems with the weak bones as we age because it steadily gets thinner and thinner and so you have weaker bones. There are other things or other reasons why your bones can get weak prematurely too and so we'll mention some of those things tonight to have you on the lookout for those. Uh, are, are bone problems common? Absolutely. Uh, in the U.S., there's 1.5 million fractures every year. And of those, 350,000 are broken hips, which really is a significant factor slowing people down. So the cost of broken bones in the United States in 2005 was $17 billion. So may be only worse today if things don't go down. So you can see why it matters to doctors, to government, to everybody that we gotta try to do something to reduce this uh, expenditure. Now, is there any warning if you've got weak bones that, to let you know? Or is it only when they break that you find out? In fact, that is the case. There is no symptoms that tell you you have weak bones. A little later, we'll get into some information on how you can pick up on that before it happens. Now, not only do you break hips, but you can break your vertebrae uh, with a what we call a compression fracture, when part of the bone just doesn't hold up anymore and it collapses with the vertebrae in the back that usually collapses in the front and that'll tip your spine forward and that's why you see people with tipped forward bones it's because they have that collapsing of the vertebrae and it throws their whole posture off it's not because they're not standing up straight they can't because their bones are throwing them in that direction the uh, when your bones are weak enough, it doesn't take even a fall necessarily for this to happen. Sometimes bending wrong, twisting, or even sneezing can trigger that collapse. So we want to catch these early. Even other kinds of fractures not from falling, things like stress fractures, are more common when your bones are thin, which you can get just from repeated activities, uh, walking a distance or so forth. If your bones are thin, you can get a fracture like this uh, fracture here just from what they call a stress fracture from repeated pounding on it. And is healing gonna be affected if you have thin bones? Actually, it is. A person with thinner bones, they take a lot longer to heal because the integrity of the bones just isn't there. And so compared to someone who's 
playing football and breaks a bone, someone who has thin bones and breaks a bone could take you know, weeks longer to heal. So there's what might happen with osteoporosis, how can that affect your life? If you get a fracture, 20% of the people that get a hip fracture die within the first year after that fracture. A third of them up with a hip fracture are in a nursing home for up to a year. And if you have a vertebral fracture, one fracture can be the beginning of further fractures in the vertebrae, so you could lose height, people can lose significant height with that. So obviously we want to avoid that from being you. So what are some risk factors that, would, that you have to look at that make you prone for thin bones? One is, is genetics. Does it run in your family? Did your mom have a broken hip? Did anybody lose height in your family? Uh, also ethnicity. We know that you are Anglo, you're Caucasian, Asian, you have a higher risk for thin bones. African Americans tend to have sturdier bones, so they have less of a problem with this, but not no problem with it. There is a gradual loss of bone strength after age 25, but particularly once a woman hits menopause and you don't have that estrogen working on you, it accelerates. So you can lose 4% of your bone density each year for the 10 years following <coughs> menopause. So that puts you at uh, a fourth or a third less dense in your bones over that 10 year period. So a person really wants to try to head that off. At menopause, you lose the influence of the estrogen. Estrogen is a significant positive factor for bone density. So you lose that at menopause. And you say, well, can I just replace it? Is that OK? Will it keep my bones good? In fact, it would keep your bones good. But on the downside is that prolonged estrogen exposure puts you at risk for other things like certain cancers and so forth. So you don't do that without a lot of consideration talking with your doctor. <coughs> okay, what, what factors can be controlled to keep you from getting this if you know you're headed that way? Uh, you want to you want to make sure you're getting exercise on a regular basis, upright exercise where you're standing and you have your bones have to resist gravity. That strengthens the bones. It encourages them to reinforce themselves. Getting calcium in your diet on a regular basis helps to reinforce the bone. Getting vitamin D so that you can use that calcium. Those are some things that you can do to help the cause. Now beside, besides the things that you can't control, there are some things that you can control. Smoking. Smoking is a significant detrimental factor for bone density. It's important that you get rid of that habit because it's going to put you at high risk for fractures. Lack of exercise, if you've just gotten out of the habit, it's, it's doing you a disservice. So it's important to get up and get moving. People that go on very low calorie diets, it, that is hard on the bones and you have to take measures to compensate for that. Poor overall nutrition, if you're eating on the run and eating fast food all the time and not getting the good foods, is going to take its toll on your bones. And then alcohol excess. So by excess, 
I'm not saying you can't have a drink a day or for men two drinks a day, but if you go beyond the recommended, that is considered excess. So three drinks, four drinks a day, that is going to take its toll on your bones too. So you have to be careful there. So how do you diagnose osteoporosis? How do you know ahead of time that you've got weak bones, that you have to be careful, that you have to take extra measures? There's a test that's called a DEXA scan, which stands for Dual Energy X-ray Absorptiometry. And with this, this is better than just a conventional X-ray to tell you the density of your bones. They can get you a readout, a, a number, to tell you how your bones compare. And so who should be tested? Now? How do you know? All women over 65 should be tested. You're far enough out from your hormone influence and women, as a, in general, body mass is not as great as men even at age 25. So once you lose that estrogen influence and things start going downhill, definitely by age 65. And anybody before 65, yes. If you have other risk factors, if you're in your family, the bones are thin, you know you're a smoker, you're taking things like chemotherapy, you drink more than your share of alcohol, <coughs> then you need to be tested before age 65 to find out so it doesn't, so a fracture isn't the first thing that lets you know that your bones are thin. Uh, there are other influences, such as certain kinds of medicines that also cause your bones to thin. Certain of the acid blocker pills, like the phylosectin, that family can make it, make it a little harder for your bones to keep the mineral in them. Seizure medicines, cortisone, if you get cortisone shots, you take cortisone pills for asthma or for whatever, they all accelerate the loss of bone density and, you know, and chemotherapy. And how do we, how does this DEXA scan scored, they measure your bone density and then they compare it with a 25 year old, which is usually when your bones are the, the thickest and the densest, and they determine how many standard deviations you are from what a 25 year old would be. So if you are one standard deviation away from to two and a half standard deviations away, then that is the osteopenia range, which is not as severe as osteoporosis, but it's the same process. And if you're two and a half standard deviations or more, then you are in the osteoporotic range, which puts you at a definite higher risk of fracture and, and increases the, the need to do something now. Okay, what can we do to help? Certainly exercise can help. First of all, exercise will strengthen the muscles of, around the bones and that gives a little protection to the bones because of the way it handles jars and jolts. So just having your muscles in shape is a start. But exercise also helps the bones, but especially the weight-bearing exercises. So going for a walk, jogging, lifting weights or doing a exercise bands from a standing position. All of that helps strengthen the bones. But is there limitations in exercise? If you already have weak bones, can you just jump into exercise? Should you? It probably is best to check with your doctor first because certain exercises, if you get into heavier weights, <coughs> Can, can cause vertebral collapse and, and cause problems. Jogging is a lot of repetitive pounding on those bones, and so if your bones are already thin, jogging may not be the right exercise for you. It may have to be something like walking. And what lifestyles can you change? Well, obviously, 
If you're smoking, you need to make that one. If there's any alcohol beyond what's recommended, you need to make that change. Um, so what about calcium? How much do you need? Children don't need as much because they absorb it better, but as we get a little older, we need to be getting at least 1,000 milligrams a day for the men and probably about 1,200 for the women. And then once you get past menopause, you may need to be getting 1,500 milligrams a day. And those calcium pills are pretty big, but you, there are ways to work with that. OK. Other places to get calcium besides those big pills, if you just don't get along with them, are certain foods, some of which have calcium in them naturally, like dairy products, and some of which get fortified, like orange juice. So trying to get more of these in your diet will help, and it may allow you not to have to take that many of those big calcium pills. And vitamin D helps you absorb the calcium. So you do need more vitamin D. Sunlight on the skin can cause your body to make vitamin D, and that's the, the most natural way. So getting a little bit of sunlight is a good thing. Now, that doesn't mean hours in the sun, because that is, ends up being detrimental and hard on the skin, but a little bit of sunlight is good for you. Vitamin, our milk is fortified with vitamin D. It doesn't have it naturally, but it is fortified. And, and dairy products in general tend to be fortified with it. Fish has some vitamin D in and of itself, so it's good to include more fish in your diet to help with the bones as well. So if estrogen helps, is it good to add it back in a pill form? Some of the debate says that if you are in the early postmenopausal stages, that adding a little estrogen will, will definitely keep the bones strong for a longer period of time. And, but the, the detrimental effects seem to become somewhere around five years or more after you've gone through the change. So it may be worth it. You have to talk it over with your doctor about your other risk factors. Maybe worth it to take it for a few years after you go through the change. And what other kinds of medications are there that can help? There are several different kinds of pills and shots. One we call the estrogen receptor modulators. And those pills work at estrogen receptor sites in the body, and they stimulate similar influence on the bone that the estrogens do, but without all of the side effects. Um, they're probably not quite as strong of an influence on the bones as estrogen itself, but they are a, a positive way to do it without having to take the risks of estrogen. There are what we call uh, anti-resorptive medications like Fosamax and Actinel, maybe some of those names are familiar. And the reclast, which is given as an uh, IV infusion, that family stops the thinning of the bones uh, all the time. The body has got a process going on where it's remodeling bones, breaking them down, and then rebuilding, breaking and rebuilding. As you get older, it does more of the breaking down and less of the rebuilding, so the bones just gradually get thinner. These anti-resorptive medications stop the, the amount of breaking down, so it's a lot slower. And then there, there are some medications that actually um, reduce that osteoclast, the cell that breaks down the bones even more aggressively. Um, and that's give, like prolia is the name of that. It's given in a shot form. Now, are there non-medical ways to help prevent fractures? Yes, this is an example of a garment that they make that if you know your hips are bad and your balance is bad, you might be a candidate for wearing something like this. It has actually a, a protective pad like football players wear over the hips that keep you from 
cracking that hip bone if you were to fall. And this we use more often in nursing homes, but if you didn't get along with the medicines, this is an option. So in general, osteoporosis is bones getting more brittle, whether it's early or late in life, but it, everybody's bone density drops after age 25, especially after menopause. Some particular risk factors are lack of exercise, lack of calcium and vitamin D, smoking, alcohol, family history. So what should we do? We should be thinking about getting that DEXA scan, that bone density scan when you talk to your doctor and it's determined that you have an additional risk factor besides your age or besides your sex, then it's determined whether you ought to have that scan. So right now I'll take some questions if you have any. Ken? We think so, I think, uh, and I'm always looking for ways that it, this won't bother me. So I'm thinking this is mainly a problem for women. And, but I'm guessing that men are not totally exempt either. Yeah, about 87% about of the people with the fractures and the thin bones are women. But 13% are men. And so, yes, if, uh, if the shoe fits, where if it's in your family, if you have habits that you know are not conducive to good bones, talk to your doctor. Maybe you need to have a bone density check, too. Yes. Are there some bones that lose density more than others, like the legs and stuff, as opposed to the back? Or? Everybody's a little bit different in terms of the rate at which they lose from different bones. Some people can have just fine vertebrae and hips that are bad, or a little bit of one and, and, a, and a lot of something else. So it, it can't always say that, yeah. Is that machine? check all the bones in the body? No, good question. Most of the time with the DEXA scan, we scan the vertebrae and the hips because those are the ones that make the biggest difference if you were to break them. But some people have like an artificial hip, so we can't scan that and tell anything from it. So sometimes they'll scan a wrist. And so those are the areas that are most threatened by a fall. So those are the ones we scan. Do you have a question? I'm wondering, how does disc degeneration play into this? I mean, disc, is, is that basically the same? No, disc degeneration has to, it's a different process altogether because the discs are, are a water-filled tissue and they lose some of the water, they dehydrate, and the bones are a mineralized tissue. We've got a, bone, a protein matrix, that, then it's all coated with lots of calcium and mineral. So different process. Yes. Um, at what point uh, is medication required for either osteopenia or osteoporosis? At what point is that decision made? Depending on, the doctor usually will help you make that decision. But with osteopenia, you want to start doing something. So at least get some calcium and vitamin D. And then you talk to your doctor about whether we add any of the other prescription pills, too. And when you're in the osteoporosis range, then you definitely need to be aggressive. So you have to have calcium, vitamin D, and prescription stuff. And then you have to periodically decide whether what you're taking is making a difference and with your follow-up scans. Has there been any controversy about whether the uh, calcium supplements are effective? Uh, no, it's, it, it's, it's whether they're a risk. They're by themselves, they don't do a lot, well, statistically. The so with vitamin D, they're better. And when you add on these prescription stuff, it, it does matter to have the calcium, so. But as a preventative? It, they have less and less influence the further away from 20, age 25 that you get. So they help some. They can help more if you do other things with them. Yes? I take calcium and vitamin, extra vitamin D 
the, um, what, what are my risks of getting maybe kidney stones or you know? That's a good question. They have looked at that with uh, people who are on calcium, and calcium pills particularly, rather than foods. And you may have a slightly increased risk of kidney stones with that, but calcium in the arteries is, does not seem to be statistically significant with women. But with men who take the calcium pills, it, is, it significantly increases your risk of getting calcium in the arteries, and so that's a bad thing. Yes? Is there certain times of the day that are better to take calcium? And I take a calcium with me in it. Of them. So is it better to take one in the morning, one at night, two together? I've heard that you can take, you shouldn't take them together because it, the body only absorbs some of them well, at a time. It, it's not entirely correct. So if, if you can only take it once a day, take it because it will still absorb the majority of it that once a day. If you can afford to to take it twice a day if you've got time and your system can handle it, then that's fine too. It doesn't make a big difference. Okay. What do you do if you have a bone that won't heal? <laughs> that is a problem. Some, there are different ways that they approach that. Sometimes they will try surgery and, and the, with screws and uniting it that way. If that doesn't work, sometimes they have some kind of a stimulator, a bone stimulator, electrical thing that they can put on there to try to help get the uh, <coughs> tissue to, to unite and mend itself again. And sometimes it just won't happen. There are certain bones that just don't. Yes. I just have a couple questions. Okay. When you talked about um, as far as the steroids, people, you know, that take steroids need to take you know, extra medication regards to calcium, et cetera. Now, does that matter how they're taking steroids? When they're inhaled, I mean, like an inhaler, well, for example? Inhaled steroids are, are absorbed to a very minor extent. They still absorb some, but to a minor extent. So that's not nearly as bad as the shots, shots in the back, right. pills, whatever. Because that's always on, you know, everything's on the one. You know, well, they have to put it on there, but it's not nearly as big of a threat with the inhaler. So, like, if you're taking 1,500 milligrams, because I'm at a max dose, so then I kind of need to make sure that I drink, like, extra, extra, extra fluid because of my kidney situation, because I'm going to be floating here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, try to do the best I can, but I'm, I'm not a large person, and... and I do the best I can, but maybe I need to be drinking a lot more or something. There, well, something that I didn't mention tonight that could be a factor here, especially for you, would be vitamin K2, which is different from the vitamin K1. Vitamin K1 helps your clotting system, and Coumadin blocks vitamin K1. But vitamin K2, which is uh, available in certain organ meats and chicken, or, uh, egg yolks and certain fermented foods like yogurt and there's a Japanese food called natto which is probably the best source. Uh, vitamin K2 can significantly help strengthen the bones without depending on calcium as the only way. It seems to have more of an effect on the architecture of the bones so that there's more reinforcing things without necessarily adding more calcium. And so in your case, that might be a good thing to go drinking plenty of fluids. It's also going to be good to help protect your kidneys. Is it any yogurt then? I mean, because I do eat yogurt, but I mean, it's Natural culture yogurt. It has to say on the side that it's a natural culture, not enzymes. And then I was just going to say, Walmart and the medicine shop, and I have no plug for either, they have a good liquid calcium. Kind of tastes like soft orange, and it's like a thousand milligrams per an ounce a day, and it's got vitamin D in it, quite a large amount. I don't know the name offhand, but those are the only two places they do because I try to do what I can without taking a lot of vitamin pills. Yeah. You know, for okay. people that have trouble taking pills. Thanks for sharing that. Yes. Do you get K2 over the counter in 
I haven't seen it around, but I suspect if you go online, you might find a place that can uh, that has it. I don't know if they make it from the natural source. We talk about organ meats uh, being a decent source for that, but then as you read more, it says it's best if it's grass-fed organ meats because something about the grass and vitamin K making and so forth. And also, I take Cryosec <clears throat> every day, and you said that kind of injures the calcium absorption. Yes, it can. And so you have to, so you need to make extra efforts to kind of compensate for that unless there's a point where you can get off the Cryosec. I won't get kidney stones then if uh, I'm not getting all of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was worried about that. Sure. We hear frequently about um, calcium and vitamin D being essential for bones. What about like magnesium? And one of the things I've read about just lately is silica. I'm not so sure about silica, but magnesium has some influence. It's not a mandatory thing to strengthen your bones, but it is found in the bones to a small degree. Boron, which is another uh, heavy metal, uh, seems to be associated with significant health, but it's not easy to find it in foods or as supplements. But people that have taken it uh, have significantly increased their bone density in a favorable way. There are certain things you can take that will make your bones denser, but they denser and brittle because of the way it gets laid down. And, but, but the boron influence is a positive influence. And it's the way this gets laid down uh, is part of the reason why we talk about if you're on the Fosamax or Actinel or Reclast, that maybe every so often you need to take a, a drug holiday one year off because they think that maybe it's laying too many things down in a way that doesn't have all the cross reinforcements. And, and so you need to give the body a break from that. Uh, however, estrogen, we know, has a very positive influence on the, the reinforcing structures and the way the architecture of the bone. Yes, please. How concerned uh, should a person be of side effects from like Fosamax and and the That's a reasonable question. Um, some of these have been associated with a slightly higher than expected influence of like fractures of the jaw or abnormal fractures in the hip in different places than you usually get a hip fracture. And uh, as a result of that, that some of the ex well, a big body of the experts in the field of bone density gathered and decided at this point they would not automatically recommend the holiday at, er at a frequent interval, but they will continue to consider it over time as, as reports keep coming in. The uh, fracture of the jaw that occurs spontaneously seems to be more commonly in women that are already on chemotherapy and and uh, estrogen blocking therapy and that significantly accelerates the <coughs> breaking down of the bone, the thinning of the bone. So, uh, so you need to talk to your doctor about that if, if you need, whether they need to consider a one year off every so often on that. The, uh, is there any other risk fact, uh, side effect that you were thinking about that I didn't um, no, I just um, had heard, though, if you have dental work, if you're on ah, one of these, yep, that okay. it can cause problems. They have seen it often enough that if you're having a tooth pulled, that it can significantly delay the healing of that socket. So the dentist or the oral surgeon is going to want to know ahead of time if you're already on Fosamax or Actinel or one in that class because they don't want to have your tooth take forever to heal your socket. So if they can know that ahead of time, then they can get the tooth pulled and healed and then get your medicine afterwards. Yes. What's your opinion on Prolia? Prolia is one of the newest ones. 
and it seems to be very effective for bones. Side effects, and we don't see them very often, side effects are a little bit riskier than some of these others. They, uh, people that are on proleon sometimes will have more serious infections. Their body doesn't seem to respond as quickly to infections sometimes, but that's not everybody. So you don't want to consider polio lightly, but it's a very effective medicine. So if other things are not working for you, you need to consider it, talk to your doctor, watch for those things, the infect, frequent infections, certain rashes. So. Janet, did you have a question? Kind of depends on where your starting point is. If you're osteopenic and not truly osteoporosis, there is a chance if you do it all right and get the exercise going and, and vitamin D and maybe a little vitamin K2, that you might be able to do that with diet alone. And if you're towards the upper end of osteopenic or in the osteoporotic range, it's very unlikely you can do it with diet alone. Well, thank you for coming out tonight. Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, I was told by a doctor that uh, like phosphoric acid affects the absorption of calcium, like in Diet Coke, for it, example. It does. Are there other substances that you think about having that affect the absorption? We talked about trilocyte. What, what in that affects it? I don't take that, but what? I, you know, Pilosec actually blocks stomach acid, and you actually do need some stomach acid to properly absorb the calcium. And so it interferes in that way. I, I, I can't name any other things, but phosphoric acid is in, in most of your soft drinks. So soft drinks can have some detrimental effect on your bones, too. So keep that in mind, especially if you know somebody that's really drinking a lot each day. And I took Axinel for five years, and I went off of it myself because I was having I was having joint pain. I was having symptoms like acid reflux, um, and, yeah. and so I, I I went off of it, and those symptoms all went away. The symptoms I was having went away probably within the last you know, first month or two after I was off. The pill form of that family, the Fosamax and the Actinel, can be associated with some harsh effects on the lower esophagus. So if you're taking that and you're having some trouble with heartburn or swallowing, you need to talk to your doctor about that because maybe we need to get you off the pill and either onto an injectable form or something that won't bother the esophagus. Yeah, good point. Okay, thanks for coming out tonight.